welcome. And once again, it's time for our panelists to interview Secretary Abella. Good afternoon, Secretary Abella, or is it good evening already? Uh, just about. <laughs> Yes, I was looking over the program of government which uh, you had submitted and uh, uh, a copy of which had been provided us. And I noticed uh, when I did the content analysis of uh, most of uh, your proposals that you seem to have uh, put civil society as pivotal to many, many goals that you want to achieve. Um, can you elaborate on this, please? Civil society has uh, become a central aspect of uh, the platform that we've set out for the plain and simple reason that uh, the voice of the people needs to be heard. Uh, I see civil society as a balancing force. And also, there is, after all, a worldwide movement where uh, thousands and millions of people are beginning to realize the power that they have within their within their grasp. At nakikita ng mga tao na meron pala silang kapangyarihan, lalo na sa pagharap ng mga isyo tulad ng kahirapan, yung mga isyo tulad ng korupsyon, mga isyo tungkol ng pagmamahal ng bayan. At nakikita ko na uh, mag mahalaga yung struktura, no? yung pagbabago ng struktura tulad na napag-usapang kanina, Pero mahalaga rin na ang bago yung, bago yung labas ay yung loob. At nakikita ko na kailangan may mabago sa Pilipino at susunod din ang pagbabago ng bayang Pilipinas. Secretary? Thank you. Yes. In one of the interviews you did, I hope I'm remembering the figures correctly, you said that the President of the Philippines appoints something like 6,000 yes. uh, people in, in the bureaucracy. No? And... Uh, if that figure is correct, that's, I think, double or nearly triple the number of appointees that the United States President has. Why is that important? And in, in the context of what you're saying about civil society, and if I understand it correctly, decentralized government. Uh, uh, the, uh, the appointed positions are very important for the plain and simple reason that one, one key issue in governance is competence. No, mahalaga yung ano, mahalaga na mahapaglagay tayo ng tao na may alam, may energy, at saka meron di integridad. Uh, manipis yung ano ko, manipis yung aking uh, mga kilala, kakilala. I have a very shallow bench. Of course, there's in, I have enough friends and all that. But I find that it is, uh, but, uh, but uh, the one reason why uh, those appointed positions are very important is because a lot of things get hampered by the fact that there are not enough competent people pushing the agenda of the administration. Why was that not possible during this administration and what would it take in the next government? You know, uh, thank you for asking that question. We're actually preparing an app where people can actually apply. You know, uh, for maybe from undersecretary down or from assistant secretary down. Because a lot of those jobs, karamihan ng mga trabaho yan, I basically, ano eh, mga, these are, uh, these are, these, these demand expertise. Eh, yung presidente naman, hindi naman siya talaga quote-unquote expert, kundi siya yung tig nagsiset ng polisiya at makes the decision. So, mahalaga na, mahalaga na makakuha ng uh, enough competent, excellent, uh, committed people. And for that, we actually have not just an app, but we actually have a program coming up. It's called National Volunteer Corps. Uh, na kung saan gusto natin mag-apply. Kung mag gusto mag-apply ang uh, ages between 18 to 35, uh, lalo na yung mga kumikonti experience, para lumahok sila, sumali sila sa pamamahala. Why not just improve the civil service so that you have career, career bureaucrats rather than political appointees? running the government machinery. Uh, tama ka, with, uh, that needs uh, improvement, civil society. On the other hand, only have six years. Only have, so, yung, six years. But if things go right and things go according to the way we understand, we see it, we can have a continuous run. We can have a, we can have 
For example, katulad itong build, 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 no? Tinuloy lang naman yung mga ibang gagawin eh. So, so kung pwede, pwede rin natin ipagdikit, ipagdugtong ang mga administrasyon kung magkaisa lang tayo ng pananaw. May I uh, add to that a point? Um, Secretary Abelia, yes, um, I think we already have in our laws an anti-ageism uh, you know, uh, philosophy. Yes. Which means that people like me who are 75 but who can still I mean, we're not in util. We're uh, I'm still lucid, and uh, yes. you know, Pretty yeah, good. like that. And uh, so, why is it that um, if I were assuming that uh, hypothetically I would apply for a job, then they'll tell me that I, Clarita Carlos, you're a fossil already at 75. But my God, my brain is uh, it's like wine. You you becomes better with age, isn't it? So. When you talked about these productive people, parang hindi mo ako sinali. Hindi <laughs> na. On the contrary, I'd like you to join my cabinet. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was just driving. I was saying there's so much ageism in this country for God's sake. <laughs> Why are you discriminating against us old people? Can we ask you? You will be old also, and you will be 75 like me. So, what are you Yes. Thank you. Secretary Abelia. Yes, sir. You said you're going to continue the build, build, build program under your term if elected as president. Could you tell us how you're going to fund these projects and what sort of projects you will pursue? Uh, well, una, I'd like to begin with the second part of your question. Like, for example, there are hard structures and soft structures. Hard infra, soft infra. Uh, for the hard, we'll talk with John Balafox. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, yung soft infra, yung katulad na, si, lagi pong sinasabi, itutuloy natin yung build, 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 hindi lang yung roads, kundi yung build, build, build the next generation. That would be, for example, education, research and development. We'd like to be able to connect it with, uh, we'd like to build the uh, research facilities of universities. And, uh, and, and, they, and they connect it with, of course, with manufacturing, uh, because it, well, let me, let me backtrack. I mean, this is all part of an agricultural interest ecosystem that I've been talking about, and uh, which would be also the, uh, the flagship project of, uh, of our administration. On the, so, yung, yung infra, the, uh, the build, build, build program would build both on the on the hard and soft infrastructures. Now, the second question, second part of the question, how would you fund uh, okay. these programs? Uh, and John, actually, we would, for example, uh, one one source would, in particular would be the one percent, uh, for example, to uh, get uh, one percent of the GD of the of the of the GDP, which would be what 150 billion. Pwede, pwede pa simula yun. And on the other hand, there's also a surprising, ano, pag-usapan na siguro natin with COA, ang laki kasi ng mga ano, underspending ng, ano, ng gobyerno. Ang laki, ang laki talaga, which we, pwede yun, actually, pwedeng gamitin yun for sovereign, uh, sovereign wealth fund at pwede gatiin yung, yung perang yun para both social safety nets at saka pagbibirs ng infrastructure tulad na napag-usapan natin. Would you... Uh... Indulge in increasing the foreign debt. Uh, you know, foreign debt is at 12.0 trillion pesos as of January 2022. It translates to, uh, based on the on, on a population of 110 million Filipinos, translate to around 109,000 pesos right. per Filipino. Now, ang sinasabi ko is that pwede actually may pera, may pera ng gobyerno, pwede gamitin. Pwede gamitin. On the other hand, for same case, kung gamitin natin kung, 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 kung kailangan mangutang, hindi kailangan matakot. Kasi kung negosyate ka, and this is one of the approach, approaches that we would like to do for the government, is to have a more entrepreneurial mindset. Alam mo kung saan pupunta, for example, have a more developmental approach. Kasi wala itong kumangihilang tayo, let's say, ng pera para sa agrikultura. Ito, al, dapat matutukan natin yon para alam natin kung saan pupunta, whether uh, kaliwakanan o kung saan itong alimpo sa ba pupunta yan. Pero, kung maga, if we approach it with an entrepreneur, we don't need to fear. We don't need to fear that just as long as we have we have an adequate we have adequate pencil pushing and of course we have enough uh, debt terms, you know. It, 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 alam natin yung length of the length of debt. Meron po kayong sinabi nung uh, unang presidential debate Opo, sponsored by SMNI. 
na habang umuupo kayo sa restaurant, pinuntahan kayo. At tumingi ng pabor. Opo. At sinabi nyo, tinurn down nyo gan-gan. Opo. So, pwede bang malaman kung may strategies kayo to curb leakages or corruption in government? Opo. Uh, thank you for that. That's, that's very much linked with uh, the comment on civil society. Kasi nakita ko na, for example, katulad ng lahat na sinasabi na, na, for example, technology na wala na dapat interface between people and uh, kung kanyari when money is involved. Pero may isang aspeto kasi na pwede talaga ipasok, uh, pwedeng antabayanan, pwedeng mabantayan ang korupsyon when you have uh, civil society involved, especially in local government. Because uh, ang isa kasi role ng, uh, and by the way, the local government code insists that there must be 25% at least of those participating in local governance should be coming from local uh, civil society. Ngayon, kung ano, ang isa kasi trabaho nila is to really make sure of, to antabayan yung mga tenders, bids and awards. So kung sasali tayo, kung kasali ang civil society dyan, pwede tutukan kung ang pera nga pa ay napapay na po. Kung tasakto nga pa yung mga implementing rules and regulations, kung napupunta ba sa, sa maayos, at kung saan pupunta yung pera. So civil society can play an active role in making sure that it becomes like a whistleblower or it becomes like a... Uh, na, uh, Take a time, like a watchdog, especially regarding corruption. Yes. Secretary, do you consider media as a critical part of the civil society that you're talking about? Because one of the problems or one of the criticisms during this administration is, is its uh, relationship with with uh, with the media. Yes. Uh, in fact, you know, I myself, not not from you directly, but. I've seen more libel cases filed against me during the past six years, more than I have in the past 20 years I've been Correct. in the business. In fact, some of the candidates running for public office have pending libel cases against me. But how do you protect those you would say uh, doing the watchdog function uh, from, from, uh, from these legal liabilities? You know, when I was you know, on my first day of being a spokesperson, I had a conversation with the press and I told them what I would like is to have a national conversation with media. Sabi ko sa kanila, I will tell, I will not lie, I will tell you the truth and if there are times when I don't talk, I don't say anything, it's because I cannot say it or I, can, I don't know what it is, but definitely we will have a conversation. If I don't know what it is, I will make sure I find out and tell you later. But the thing is, it's more important to have a conversation, from my perspective, to have a conversation with the media, mag-usap tayo, para magka-intindihan tayo. Naintindihan ko naman yung mga, you know, mga positions, for example, mga nag-ibang mga, na ibang media, na itindihan ko na yung motibo. Pero, pwede naman, pwede makipag-usap. It's not just media, Secretary. Although media is part of it, but yes. when you say civil society, it could be anyone exposing corruption or wrongdoing in government. But how, is, do you, how do you protect them from this legal liability? Una-una uh, siguro, uh, uh, not siguro, una-una, uh, kung pwede yung the criticism should be within for formal bounds. Like for example, uh, if they formally join, for example, the, the, uh, the local government unit, Pwede sila, pwede, the conversation can go there. It can, it can begin there. And so, kumbaga, may, may pinagbabasihan. Hindi lang nagbubunga nga. So, meron talaga pinagbabasihan yung pinagsasabi nila. Secretary Abelia. Yes, sir. Magandang gabi po. Yes, ma'am. Um, may nabas ako dito sa inyong pinadala sa aming inform, um, information sheet ang phrase na confident national identity yes. na gusto niyo rin mag-develop nito para sa next generation. Ano pong ibig sabihin yun ng confident national identity? Uh, <clears throat> ganito, may tatlong bagay ako nakita na tatlong bagay ako nakita na medyo problemato, problemato sa panahong ito. Una-una, ang laki ng agwat ng mahirap at mayaman. Pangalawa, nawawala yung tiwala. At pangatlo, parang nawawala yung ano, nawawala yung pagmamahal sa bayan. Kasi parang lagi na, laging binababa ang pagka-Pilipino. Uh, ito na notice ko lang, I just noticed it. Na when I was working at the DFA, I noticed that there was a difference between the attitudes of people coming from the Middle East, for example, working in the Middle East, and they would say, kabayan, kabayan, you know. Pero doon sa kabila, when you, for example, you go to more Western countries, not necessarily Europe, but other, for example, uh, you know, uh, North America, for example, there's a tendency to say, kayong mga Pilipino, 
you know kayo mga ay kung ba iniiba na yung sarili no pero nakita ko din yan na ang pagka Pilipino natin medyo talagang uh, even our jokes are down so siguro i go to ano i go to uh, i i the, the the thing that comes to mind is would the Filipinos fight for the Philippines would would we fight for example if there was some sort of invasion you know would we actually get up, get up arms and uh I suppose there would be it, it I don't know if I'm not entirely sure if we would fight as a nation as a, as an entire nation as compared to let's say fighting for let's say my property or my ethnic identity so kumbaga ang mahalaga na ang nakikita ko mahalaga na magkaroon tayo ng pagkakaintindi na tayo ay Pilipino at uh, karapat dapat ay karapat dapat tayo sa bayan at ang bayan ay karapat dapat sa atin. But sir, how will you? <laughs> but sir, how will your government or your administration implement uh, developing a confident national identity? We now know we now have a clear idea of what it means, but you know how it will be implemented. Okay. Uh, that is when I ask the participation of, I challenge the participation of civil society, and of course, and one aspect of that would be the National Volunteer Corps. I understand when some people say, let us have mandatory, a mandatory military service, because that's supposed to build in, that's supposed to build in a certain uh, stamina, that's supposed to build in certain moral fiber, but uh, one, uh, the way I see, the way I understand it is, being only being in office for only six years, being, you can only we can only do so much. But we could plant the seeds for a confident national identity way. Number one, encouraging civil society to stand up for what is right and what is wrong and, and expose what is wrong. And the other one is for Filipinos, actually, the younger Filipinos to really begin to begin to love. Uh, begin to want to participate in nation building. For example, the National Volunteer Corps, we would like them to be parang ate, kuya, sa next generation. For example, may na-miss tayo ng mga two years ng education, no? uh, two years during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, so gusto natin silang pumunta doon sa film, uh, sa mga komunidad, at pwede silang tumulong, eh, kung hindi man maituro lahat, at least, at least teach mastery of reading, writing, arithmetic. Kasama yan. O kaya, pag, uh, you know, pag papalago ng mga pagtatanim o pagtuturo ng ano, pagtuturo ng uh, coding skills, pagpapakita na pwede palang maging isang kara, maging isang modelo. Isang uh, modelo. So, kung kumbaga, showing by example that it is possible to it is possible to uh, to be a young, vibrant nationalist, a patriot, I'm sorry. That was a very insightful uh, observation uh, you made, Secretary Abelia, in regard to comparing uh, overseas workers in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis workers in North America yes. and similar places. And uh, what I see there in the, in the insights that you have shared with us is that really those who are in North America are more likely, or in Britain for that matter, to act more British and more Americans yes. than they are Filipinos. Yes, yes. And that means, therefore, that they in fact look down on those working in the Middle East and similar places. And that's a very insightful observation. So the Filipinoness that you see is really there in the people who are working in the Middle East rather than those pretentious, idiotic people in the North American. Uh, <laughs> Professor you know. Carlos, I think, I think so agree with you, but let, just, let, me, let me just add something. I think it's because in the Middle East, there's no possibility of becoming a citizen. But in Western countries, there is a possibility of actually becoming a citizen of the United States. But in a certain, uh, you know, you work. Uh, maybe it also has something to do with a kind of workers yeah. that you export, mm -hmm. uh, which are really, you know, for the dirty things that uh, be, uh, their own citizens would not want to do. But um, this is the only time that I, I've heard that kind of comparison, and 
it, it's really something so so monumental, you know. And it tells you the divide. That's the reason why I really get peeved when I hear people in the United States, you know, preaching to us uh, as if they suddenly have the answers to all the questions. And that's on account of the insightful observation that you have made. Yes. All right. I was reading through your 13-page uh, program here, which was provided us, uh, Secretary Abelna, and I was looking for something so close to my heart, which is, of course, defense and security. So if I may, uh, I'd like to repeat the question I asked uh, Kalyodi earlier. It's about the Balikatan, and um, are you happy about the ratcheting up of the Balikatan on Monday uh, to, well, I don't about know. four times the number? And what is your take on the American-Australian consortium, which have, I think, signed a fairly long uh, lease on so big Bay? Yes, uh, right. I don't know if I'm happy or I'm ecstatic about the whole thing, but it's something I believe that uh, uh, that you know that is a necessary thing at this stage. Simple, for the plain and simple reason that we need to balance, you know, we, we have neither economic power nor military power, but we certainly can become uh, an outpost, an outpost for democracy. Uh, in the meanwhile. In the meanwhile, yeah. Until we're able to build our own strength, internal strength natin. Naikita ko po yung wisdom na habang wala tayong lakas, ay dapat magpalakas tayo ng loob. Doon pumapasok yung independent, uh, yung confident national identity. Kasi we only have so much time bago talaga tayo balingan. Hindi natin alam ano mangyayari. So kailangan talaga may tibay tayo ng loob para mangyari man ang mangyari, kaya natin lumaban o kaya malupig man tayo, masasaktan sila at pagsisisihan nila ang kanilang mga attempts to, uh, you know, to take over. Pero yung po, katulad doon yung sinasabi yung balikatan, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a tactical move. We can, I mean, hanggat, hanggat sa met, ma, maka, makalikom tayo ng enough strength and enough confidence to be able to fight back as Filipinos and not as somebody else's alliance or, or ally. So, ganun po. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And once again, time is going by so quickly. For now, we'll have to take a short break, yes. Secretary Abelia. Yes, ma'am. So stay tuned, everyone. We'll be right back at the Deep Pro. Secretary, yes. you've mentioned agriculture in your platform. In fact, yes. the term you use is you want to make agriculture a, a mega industry. Yes. Um, there are a lot of problems in agriculture, yes. among which more than half of the Filipinos live in rural areas, right. and yet the sector only contributes a little over 9% to GDP. Right. Could you flesh out or give us details about what you have in mind when you say you want agriculture to be a mega industry? Well, first and foremost, we want uh, agriculture to be a, a mega industry. Uh, let me address first that, the last part of your question, that it only contributes something like 9%. But that's not due to their, that's not due to them. That's due to government neglect. You know, eh, hindi naman sa inyong supportahan eh, katulad niya sasabihin. May nakausap ko na business consultant, I'm sure if I mentioned him, uh, you would know this person. 
Pero sabi niya, eh hindi kasi competitive yung mga ano natin, mga farmers natin. Pa, paano ko naman ilalapan niya sa Vietnam at sa ano, uh, Vietnam at Thailand? Eh, kompleto sila ng ano, nasuporta. Eh tayo wala. We actually, it's really a, a benign, I don't know if it's benign, but it's neglect. You know, uh, so anyway, going back to that, uh, the, the, the other part of your question, how do we want to address that? How do you realize your vision of creating a mega agriculture industry? Yeah, what we'd like to do first and foremost is, uh, as soon as possible, is to create a board of agriculture investment. You know, to get people who are actually practitioners, not just ex experts, not just experts in the trade itself, but actually uh, those who have experience and those who have financial uh, understanding so that we could create, uh, we could raise bonds, for example, to, so that we could use for, we could use that. And also to, so that we can specifically, uh, uh, specifically create uh, a whole ecosystem. I, I keep going back to that, to this ecosystem uh, and address, for example, that number one problem. Why, uh, for example, of, uh, of, you know, of, uh, uh, of the, the, those is those who are actually uh, those who actually experience the worst hunger, the worst uh, privation, are the most vulnerable are those in the agricultural sector. There is a moral component to this. For example, when we talk to when kupin ng usapan natin na to lumalaki ang GDP natin, pero meron tayong 23 to 26 million na katawan na mahirap. At aside from yung mahirap sila, pero pang 12.5 million people na nakakaranas ng gutom. Nakakaranas sila ng gutom. At ang una, ang isa sa mga tao na I, I talked with, sabi ko, eh, ano siya eh, uh, he was the manager of a huge plantation in, uh, in Mindanao. And sabi ko, bakit, bakit ganito ang puso mo? Sabi niya, kasi nakikita ko ang gutom ng tao. So basically, kaya natin pinapasok ito, dahil sa una-una, pwede kasi mangyari na lumaki ang, ang, ang agrikultura pag tinutukan natin. Pangalawa, uh, magkakaroon tayo ng genuine na industriya na pwedeng scalable. Kasi naman, BPO, hindi naman scalable. Uh, a lot of the MSMEs, a lot of them, uh, for, I'm not just talking about the micro, I'm talking about the medium, uh, ay, mga ano din, traders, puro angkat, you know, the products come from China uh, or some other areas, no? So, ang, so the point is, Kailangan natin ng isang industriya na scalable, na pwedeng kumita, na pwedeng bibigyan ng trabaho, na ma-address ma ma yung guto, at it can also address inflation. So, yun, that's the, that's the, the, so using the, ano, muna, yung uh, Board of Agriculture Investments, at i-connect natin, for example, i-connect natin sa, sa region to development, para alam, we can produce our own uh, from, from seeds to uh, pampataba all the way to manufacturing, all the way to uh, post-harvest facilities, all the way to agricultural, uh, community agricultural centers, all the way to even to domestic tourism. Pwede natin sila ipagkamit. Uh, meron, tayong, meron tayong roadmap dyan at, uh, na, na tinatapos at um, alam din natin kung ano pwedeng mangyari at pwedeng gawin. Are there any other government interventions you think are necessary? Because public spending on agriculture is something like 1.7% of the entire national budget. Relative to the public spending of other ASEAN countries, 1.7% is actually, on agriculture is very small. Correct. Ang pwede kasi natin, ano dyan, we can do a two, three track solution. No, one is uh, uh, divert some of the some of the build, 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 so divert some of the uh, MSMEs, and then also, pwede mang hiram. I keep saying that, although some, some candidates felt na hindi, hindi viable na manghiram. Pero kung alam mo actually kung saan pupunta ang pera mo, pwede manghiram yan, dapat mga manghiram. Basta sigurado ka lang kung saan pupunta ang pera. By the way, isang problema talaga ng, ano, ng, uh, ng uh, gobyerno is lack of absorption, absorptive uh, capability. May pera, hindi naman alam kung paano gastuin, you know. Basta, you know, nakita ko ito, for example, I've been incorporate, I've been involved in corporate life, I've been involved in government life, and I tell you what, there is great efficiency in corporate life. There is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of, this in government, there's a lot of discussion of throughput, yung mga proseso. Pero at the end of the day, kulang talaga sa output. No offense, man, pero yun ang talaga nakikita ko. So, kailangan talaga na, well, we want we want to inject we want to involve more people who are uh, yung talagang may expertise 
at talagang may experience at alam nilang ginagawa nila lalo na sa agrikultura. Last question. Sorry, apologize my yes. fellow panelists. You talked about integrating regional markets. Yes. Now, there's been a law passed, I think six or seven years ago, the Cabotage Law, mm. uh, that was supposed to um, liberalize the domestic shipping industry with the aim of reducing the logistics cost of bringing goods from, say, Mindanao to Luzon. Mm. And yet, six or seven years after this law, it's still more expensive to bring goods from Mindanao to Manila than it is to bring goods from Mindanao say, to Hong Kong or mm. farther away markets. What can be done? I mean, the law is already there. Will, I suppose. Political will. You know, if you can, if uh, if the current administration can say, let's finish the bill, 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 we can actually, if it's already there, we can actually implement it. Yeah, you see the same thing cabotage law. Dati po kayong undersecretary sa DFA. Opo. At naging first spokesperson ng Pangulong Duterte. Opo. Ang katanungan ko po galito, no? Noong March 2, 2022, mayroong balita, no? Na ang isang korte sa Francia ay nagbigay ng award sa Sultan of Sulu's heirs ng 14.92 billion dollars. Ito po yung claim natin sa Saba. Okay. Magkatarungan po ako, kung kayo po yung maging presidente, would you or would you not pursue our claim on Saba? Atin po yun. Atin po yun. At bakit po? Uh, dahil lang po sa, ano, yun dahil lang po sa relasyon na kalawang na uh, nung uh, relasyon natin sa Sultan of Sulu at sa kanyang kanilang claims. So ang puntos ko po dyan is ituloy po natin. Ituloy po natin at uh, tinan, tinan po din din natin kung uh, short of... Uh, I, I would suggest, again, a uh, diplomatic solution, uh, short of exercising any force, which has been suggested before. Pero kung pwede, uh, ituloy po natin yung diplomatic pag-uusap para makita po natin kung paano po natin ma-maximize ma, ma yung ating mga claims doon sa lugar na yun. Meron po tayong batas, no? Republic Act 9522, yung baseline law. Okay po. Ngayon po, ito po ay supposedly remedial law para doon sa nangyari sa definition ng national territory sa ilalim ng 1973 Constitution at 1987 Constitution. Yung 1973 Constitution ang minakalagay doon sa definition ng national territory na atin din po yung mga lupain by historic right or legal title. Ito po ay nawala sa definition ng national territory doon po sa 1987 Constitution. If you become president, would you amend Republic Act 9522, the base stands long? Kasi po sinabi na, we drop the ball here. Hindi natin na-define dito na ang ating pala ang Saba. In which case, I think we need to revisit. I do not pretend to know the legal aspects of that. But we need to revisit it. Because if, you know, if there's anything at all that we need to be able to insist on, we need to know what is ours and what is not ours. Uh, what is what, what you know, like what what truly belongs to us? We need to revisit the law. We need to revisit the whole claim, and I believe we also need to talk with the stakeholders. What about the interest of the Sabahans, Secretary, the the, the natives in, in yes. Sabah who are not there? There are actually Filipinos there, but they're undocumented and in effect right. stateless. But and these are different from the Sabahans. They probably identify more with Malaysia than the Philippines. Is not a consideration in no, finding a resolution to this? That's exactly why I said that we need to have a conversation, we need to talk. They, this would be part of our process where we need to be able to, be, to, to talk with the stakeholders whether, you know, kung ano yung kanilang, ano yung, ano yung take nila sa situation na yun. We need to talk with the stakeholders. Yes, uh, I'd like to follow through uh, Rolex's uh, uh, question in regard to your stint at the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs. It has something to do with uh, the number of legations that we have, consulates as well as embassies. Are we not uh, trying to be like superpowers and having so many, many embassies and uh, consulates? I remember that uh, that was, um, you know, during the Cory Aquino administration, that is one of the main tasks that uh, Senator Mercado gave to me to rationalize 
than so many, many uh, embassies and, and consulates that we have. Um, did you encounter that kind of challenge when you were there? Uh, as far as I know, that uh, th there were, in fact, there are a number of uh, offices that are pending, but they haven't been opened because of, uh, you know, uh, as far as, as, as I remember, right? Uh, we tayo ng, ano, ng, um, uh, budget to open cert certain offices. And, but the main consideration has always been, kung saan may Pilipino, dapat may representation tayo. That's where I'm going, because it seems like it's the Filipino overseas uh, workers who will decide where you're going to set up a legation. There's nothing wrong with protecting their interests, right. but I think the core of our diplomacy was to sell to the world, you know, economic diplomacy, and we seem to have forgotten that. Uh, that that's true that uh, in the certain, uh, but I think connectado, I believe connectado kasi economic diplomacy or the lack of it, sa ating ability to produce. Uh, otherwise, a benta natin will be extracted products na, na hindi talaga gaano value added kasi ma mahina din naman yung ating manufacturing ah wala na tayong manufacturing eh. so me medyo nagbago talaga yung ano nagbago talaga yung yung landscape uh, so totoo na baka kailangan natin magbago na i-revisit natin yung ating mga yung pillars in fact mayroon po yung pang-apat na pillar eh, na hindi hindi pinag-uusapan yung <laughs> na pag-usapan natin to yung pang-apat yung cultural yung cultural diplomacy na kung saan dapat maibenta natin ng maayos ang Pilipino, ang, Pilipi, ang Pilipinas para katulad na nagawa ng Korea but maybe not in the same level at this stage pero pumaga yung the, the branding of it pero meron na tayo actually ano eh, meron talaga tayong ano tawag yung malalim no? ang, ang lalim ng social capital ng Pilipino abroad uh, for example even in Israel di ba sabi ni well, Bibi Netanyahu sabi niya mahal na mahal niya Pilipino dahil lang sa nag-aalaga ang nag-aalaga ng kanyang nanay ay Pilipina. So, kung pag meron tayong malalim na social capital, pero huwag na natin basta gayahin, for example, ng Korea, kasi meron din naman. Pero ang pwede natin gawin kasi, uh, katulad doon nakita namin, uh, yung uh, i-maximize natin, for example, yung ating entertainment, yung ating, uh, yung ating movie industry. For example, in 2006, we were in, uh, in Nairobi, and we found that, that during lunchtime, humihina yung traffic. Why? Kasi pati yung ano, yung mga ang tawag nito, pati yung mga parliamented members of parliament were actually stopping to watch the teleserie of, uh, what's his name? Uh, Pangako sa'yo. Yeah, Pangako sa'yo. Uh, <laughs> tandaan, tandaan nyo pa. So, kung mga, kung pwede siguro, ay talagang ano, uh, pwede magkaroon, magkaroon tayo ng re, uh, tweaking at streamlining at tingnan natin kung ta saan talaga tayo magbibigay, uh, magbibigay ng, ano, ng emphasis. But that's another dimension of my question, which is really, why should we be exporting this kind of labor, which is uh, low-wage labor, being caregivers for the elderly and, you know, both ends of the demographics, when we can, in fact, be exporting engineers, doctors, medical personnel, and the like, and um, give it to other countries with... Um, you know, less competent people to do the caregiving work, which for most parts, based on the reports coming to us, are those who are more likely to be maltreated um, in their places of work. So um, that's why I said, with the advances in uh, technology in communication, you don't need to establish an embassy or a consulate wherever Filipinos are. Like in the United States, how many consulates do you have there when you only need one? at Washington, D.C. I mean, how many consulates do you need to renew passports and, uh, you know, get people to pledge to be Philippine citizens again? This is what I mean. The yeah. bureaucratic reform needs to start somewhere, and I think the DFA should be a good start. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well taken. Very well taken. Noted and well taken. Thank you. Secretary Abelia, so my question is about foreign policy. I think you expect this. Um, as I understand, you will continue the um, foreign policy line of uh, President Duterte expressed in this very elegant statement. Friends to all, enemies to none. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this reminds me of the foreign policy of the United States for most of its history, like from, the, from its founding. 
um, it was neutral um, in any wars in Europe. And it only got involved and, and took a position in world wars um, during the First World War. So my question is, uh, because I have, I've seen that you voted to be uh, to be neutral in the Ukraine Russia uh, conflict in in one of the presidential debates. So my question is, do you see any link between a country's um, foreign policy position in 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 these kinds of conflict and its internal development? Okay. Because you know, I would like to link this to your idea of magpalakas tayo ng loob. Uh -huh. So do you see any any link between these two? Uh Una -una, uh, although I said neutral, uh, tandaan natin na uh, we uh, nag-sign tayo do sa UNGA. Huh? Uh, we signed up, uh, the UNGA statement condemning the violence. But if you read, if you read the statement, and I think I'm sure you did, uh, it condemned the violence, but it did not condemn any aggressor, which I thought was brilliant. You know, which it was brilliant na. You know, you, yeah, you can do something like this and still not, hindi, wala kong kinakalaban. I, I believe in, in, at a certain stage, tulad ng habang, habang nagpapalakas tayo, dapat marunong tayong gumawa, ganun ang dapat nalakad natin. Na hindi tayo, hindi tayo, we're not, no, we're not pushovers. And we can actually make statements, we can actually make, take a position, but we don't need to antagonize anybody right now, especially kung baka meron na pag tayo mga interest or ongoing negotiations. So, yun, so going back, uh, kailangan talaga na, naniniwala ako na eh, pwede natin gawin itong mga bagay na ito. Uh, iba yung economic sanction, iba rin yung diplomatic sanctions. Ang ginawa natin was a diplomatic sanction, pero wala naman tayong abilidad right now to have economic sanctions. So, doon tayo sa diplomatic. Thank you, Secretary Abelia. Yes, ma'am. And now you may give your closing remarks. Uh, <laughs> tapos na ba yun? <laughs> Unfortunately, one hour went by very quickly. <laughs> so yeah, ganito na lang. Unang-unang uh, nagpapasalamat ako, Karen, sa oportunidad. No? Pero gusto ko siguro kausapin ang ating Filipino electorate. Uh, nakakatuwa pong pakinggan na nagbabago ang ating yeah. political landscape at nagbabago din po ang electorate. At uh, ngayong, ano po, ngayong Mayo uh, 9, 2022, ay hinihikayat ko po kayong to do something new and to do something bold. And that is to vote according to, accord, not just according to conscience, but according to vision. Meron po ako ililipad sa inyo na pananaw. At ang pananaw po ay ito, na pwede pong magkaroon ng isang siglo Pilipino, na pwede pong magkaroon ng isang Philippine century, na kung saan meron pong peaceful economic rise ang Pilipinas na pwede pong magkaroon ng isang daang taon na isang daang taong pagtaas, pag-angat ng ating bayan. Kung man lang tayo mismo ay ating pong, uh, ating pong tanggapin na ang pagbabago ay hindi naka, nakalagay sa, sa, sa balikat ng presidente lang, kundi para sa buong sambayanan. That they could also have a nation that is righteous, peaceful, and joyful. A nation that is just and a nation that is worthy of its people and a people worthy of its nation. This is a vision that I have and I share it with you and I say it's possible and let's do it and let's just do it together. Marami salamat po. Salamat din sa ating mga panelists. I think what resonated with me the most was when Secretary Abella said, hindi ba napakaganda ng ating bansa kung hindi lamang sa balikat ng ating magiging Pangulo na kasandalang kabukasan ng ating bansa, kundi para sa atin din at bilang mga kababayan na may malasakit at merong responsibilidad para sa ating bansa. 
And we're down to our last candidate for tonight. Ang susunod na kandidato ay may battle cry for unity para sa kanya. Pagkakaisa ng sambayan ng Pilipino sa gitna ng malalaking problema ng ating bansa, ang susi...